I got the Nikon D500 here. It's an APS-C camera, 20 megapixels, 10 frames per second, but it's two grand. You could get a full frame camera for that much. Is this the perfect wildlife and sports camera? We're gonna test it. We're gonna do some wildlife and we're gonna put it up against the 70 Mark II. Let's go. away from some of the weight. It helps me keep it stable too. Comparing the real world results from the 70 Mark II with the Canon 100 to 400 Mark II versus the D500 with the Nikon 200 to 500, the cheaper Nikon combination produced sharper and cleaner results in a variety of different settings. The sharper probably comes from the lack of an AA filter on the Nikon and the cleaner probably comes from better Nikon sensors. Even though I shot the Nikon at a higher ISO, the blue skies on the Nikon had less noise than on the Canon. Nikon sensors typically have less noise and we're really excited to have a Nikon sensor we can finally use for wildlife shooting. That Canon combination has been our recommendation for mid-range wildlife shooters and the Nikon is beating it, so that's kind of a big deal. But we are planning a full review of Nikon wildlife lenses soon, so subscribe to see that. Usually when I'm out shooting with my 7D Mark II, I have to either wait to get home to share pictures or I take a picture of the back of the camera with my cell phone. Snapridge by Nikon solved this. It allowed me to instantly post beautiful wildlife pictures to Instagram and Twitter, and that timeliness really matters for those of us who are into social networking. It's not the best for wildlife and sports though, where you might be taking hundreds or thousands of pictures because it is transferring constantly and it can really burn up the batteries on both the phone and the camera. But nonetheless, if you're into social networking, Snapbridge is the best tool available. When I'm shooting in close quarters like this, I put it in continuous quiet instead of continuous high because the shutter noise in continuous high is enough to disturb the birds. I notice no matter which mode I'm using, the image stabilization jumps around after every shot like it doesn't it turns off the image stabilization briefly so your viewfinder is just jumping all over the place which is real annoying I had no problem recovering all the highlight detail from this accidentally overexposed shot of a highly reflective white swan in direct sun The big dynamic range of the D500's RAW files really helps with high contrast wildlife shots like this one. The recovered shadows look good. Full frame cameras like the D750, which is the same price, they're better for most things, landscapes, portraits, general shooting, low light photography. But APS-C sensors have this one advantage where if you're gonna have to crop anyway, that extra pixel density will just give you more detailed pictures. We've tested this time and time again. That means you'll get sharper pictures for wildlife with the D500 than you would with a D750 or even a D810. It's the best buy. For this Osprey shot, I had to recover both the highlights and the shadows. The huge buffer and fast XQD card mean that we have the option of shooting birds in flight with RAW and thus creating final images with a dynamic range that more closely resembles the way our eyes see the world. What makes a good sports camera is a combination of usability, fast focusing, and a high frame rate that takes a lot of frames per second. In our normal sports test, all these cameras would have gotten 100%. Uh, so we needed to make it a little more difficult. Our normal sports test is shooting my daughter walking towards me with three passes at a good clip under artificial light, no sunlight because there's too much variation in that. And then we count the total number of sharp shots across, across those three passes. This time, to make it harder, I had her walk quickly and make her pace a little more erratic 
to potentially throw off a, a more predictable focusing system, the results were a little surprising. The D500 cleaned up. It completely dominated the 7D Mark II, getting almost twice as many sharp shots. 7D Mark II is getting a little long in the tooth now. Even though they're both 10 frames a second, the D500 actually took a lot more shots because the 7D Mark II delayed a little bit between shots trying to gain focus, and the D500 just got it that much faster. Should you get the $6,500 D5 instead for sports? Well, maybe, but it only got 16% more sharp shots, and that's not a whole lot. The images were cleaner in, at high ISOs, but they weren't necessarily sharper because this D500 lacks the sharpness ruining anti-aliasing filter. The camera that actually won though was showed up the, the day we filmed this. It's the Canon 1DX Mark II, a full frame camera that, well, it beat the D5 by just 6%, so it's really close. Overall, I think for sports, the D500 is, is definitely the best value. You can save yourself 4,500 bucks over the D5, and for that, you can get yourself some good glass, and that's probably gonna make way more of a difference for sports. So where's the D750? Well, we don't have it, but it would perform between the D810 and the 7D Mark II. It's also an excellent full-frame sports camera. What about the Sonys? Well, they have very different controls and the focusing system works so drastically differently that we decided we have to make a whole separate video about it. Subscribe to see that coming soon. We all spend a lot of time like pixel peeping and stuff, but really the most important aspect of a camera is the, the controls, the usability, because that's what makes the difference between getting a shot and completely missing the shot. And a little bit of dynamic range or, or sharpness doesn't matter at all if you don't get it focused in time, if you can't see the screen correctly. The D500's controls and usability are the best we've ever had on a DSLR, period. Check it out. It's got a tilting screen, and, and this is a really big deal because constantly, all the time, for lots of different types of photography, I'm either shooting over my head, maybe like over a crowd, and being able to tilt the screen down like that makes it so much easier to see. It keeps the glare off of it on sunny days. Uh, or for landscapes and stuff, video, I often have the tripod below me, and that would require me to like get on my knees and sometimes get in the water or the mud. But being able to tilt it out like that and see the screen clearly, it just it helps me compose the shot. It helps me get better focus. It makes like a very practical difference in my photography. And the same kind of thing applies for the, the touch screen. Being able to focus like that when I'm using Live View lets me know that I for sure got it in focus. The cousin over here, the D7200, lacks all that stuff. It doesn't have a tilt screen. It doesn't have a touch screen. The D750 does have a tilt screen. It's really useful and it's also full frame. But what the D750 lacks is this little thumbstick here. This little thumbstick. This is a big, big deal. If you're a wildlife or sports photographer, you know that you need to change the focusing point in quickly. In sports, somebody, you want somebody on the left side of the frame, but then they change directions, and then you want them on the right side of the frame. And you need to be able to just pan it around really quickly because if it takes you half a second, well, you've just missed five shots. So every split second really counts. And this thumbstick, which is straight from the D5, works way better than the directional pad that you get on the D750 or the D7200. Nikon, fantastic work on the controls. But if you're a video shooter, well, the, D7, the D500 is still like fantastic for an SLR, but it's lacking that electronic viewfinder that the mirrorless cameras have. And for video, I can't tell you how useful the electronic viewfinder is. So often we're shooting in bright sun and we just cannot see the back screen, not on any camera. And being able to hold it up to your eye and see what you're recording and being able to zoom in in that electronic viewfinder while blocking out the sun, it's just, it's just practical and incredibly useful. So mirrorless cameras still have it for, for video. Oh, and one more thing, a request. Uh, with a lot of focusing points, it can take a, a while, a fraction of a second, but a while to get from one side to the other by pushing this repeatedly. Let, give me a, a trackpad or a ball or like some mirrorless cameras. Let me drag my thumb across the screen like this while I have it up to my eye, just so I can more smoothly and precisely select focusing points. Nikon, Canon, Sony, somebody grab that and run with it. So the fun part of the test is pretty much over because for me, it's all about how it behaves in the real world. And when we were shooting the wildlife, it, it worked fantastically. It got everything in focus. The shots looked great, but I know people are going to want to objectively see how it compares against its little brother, the D7200, how the image quality compares against the Canon 
7D Mark II, things like the dynamic range, and how it compares against full frame cameras. So let's check it out. In all our sample shots, the 21 megapixel D500 seems slightly sharper than the 24 megapixel D7200, which is surprising. But that means that if you're looking for the ultimate detail in an APS-C body, you shouldn't let the D500's lower megapixels scare you. At all ISOs, the D500 showed very slightly less shadow noise than the D7200. At very high ISO, such as ISO 51200, the difference is a little more pronounced because we have to push the D7200's exposure. However, if low noise is a priority for you, you might be happier with a full-frame camera such as the D750 or D810, which will be at least twice as clean. Comparing the $6,500 full-frame D5 against the D500, the D5 has far less noise as we expected. But we didn't expect the D500 to be sharper, substantially sharper, even with the full-frame Nikon 7200 f2.8 lens. The D5 has an AA filter, an anti-aliasing filter, and that reduces moiré, but it also reduces sharpness. The D500 doesn't have this filter, and if you're weighing these two sports bodies, pick the D500 for detail and the D5 for low noise. At ISO 50,000 and above, the D5 is both sharper and cleaner, and thus the D5 remains the best choice for extremely low-light photographers. Comparing the D500 to the Canon 7D Mark II with each company's newest 70-200 f2.8 lens, the D500 is noticeably sharper, again, probably because the 7D Mark II has this mostly unnecessary AA filter that our data shows reduces sharpness by 15-25%. to Sports and wildlife photographers care about detail, making the D500 a much better choice. Raising the exposure by 5 stops from ISO 500, recovered shadows from the D500 are much cleaner. We didn't see much difference in noise between these two cameras. However, at higher ISOs, the difference in sharpness becomes even more obvious. For Canon owners shooting indoor sports, it might be worth switching. So the D500 for an APS-C camera has stellar image quality, but it's never going to match a full frame camera. It's just not going to. So if, if you are shooting landscapes or portraits, you shouldn't spend $2,000 on the D500. Instead, you should get probably D750 or maybe even a, a used D810, which goes for about $2,200 or maybe a D800 or a D800E. Any of those will give you substantially better image quality than any APS-C body, but for APS-C bodies, you really can't do better than the D500. And if you, so if you need it for sports or wildlife, you're going to do well. Now let's test out the video capabilities of the D500. Right away, let me just say the usability of it is pretty fantastic. It has a tilting screen that lets you see it easily when it's mounted on a tripod above or below you and you can touch to focus. We found that really useful. Of course, it's got headphone and mic jacks. I say of course, but the A6300 does not have a headphone jack. Really strange. And uh, overall, it seems to work well, but it has this severe crop when you go into 4K mode, which is why this scene got so much tighter than the last scene. Now let's check out the autofocusing capability. So you can touch the screen to refocus, which is good. But unlike the Canon 80D, the focusing is not smooth. It, it gets there, but it's, it's really jerky and non-cinematic. So if you're going to try to change focus while recording, you're going to need a focus puller. 
Below ISO 800, we never really notice any difference in image quality. But before we go through these side-by-side -side clips, they serve their purpose for objective comparisons. But if you want to see nice examples of video taken with the D500, just look for this logo during the video. At ISO 800, my home's LED lighting caused horizontal flickering on the two Nikons, but not on the Panasonic. The shutter speeds were the same. I think this is caused by a slower sensor readout from the Nikon cameras. It definitely highlights the value of the less expensive GH4, but this only occurred at shutter speeds faster than 1 1 20th, which you wouldn't normally be using in artificial light. At ISO 3200 and above, the D5 is about twice as clean as the D500, which is about twice as clean as the GH4. At ISO 50000 and above, the D5's bigger sensor is the clear choice. If low-light 4K video is important to you, however, our previous show that the A7S II is a much better choice. This is the D500 at H2, which I think is ISO 200,000. The D500 focuses quickly in the studio, and having focusing points going to the edge of the viewfinder was incredibly useful for focusing on the near eye while filling the frame. In fact, it's the most usable portrait camera we've ever tested. The D500's image quality and dynamic range at the base ISO is good enough for the vast majority of portrait photographers. However, for two grand, you could buy a new full-frame D750 or even a used D800E or D810. Here, the D810 shows a far more detailed image for two reasons. It has 50% more megapixels, and it's using the entire full-frame lens. The D500 uses less than half of the optical sharpness of full-frame lenses. Recovering shadows in the hair, we see that the dynamic range of the D810 also beats the D500, even at ISO 200. We'd see an even bigger difference if we use the D810's native ISO 64. In action shots, rolling shutter turns straight lines into diagonal lines. Comparing the latest 4K DSLRs, the Canon 1DX was very slightly better than the Nikon D500 and D5, but they're all just okay. Let's wrap this up. The D500 rocked. It just, it just completely whipped the 7D Mark II. The 7D Mark II continues to be cheaper, but the D500 is sharper, faster, cleaner, has better dynamic range, has 4K video. It has this awesome snap bridge Wi-Fi feature, which I loved. It has a tilt screen. It has a touch screen. It's, it's more expensive, but it's, it's more camera. Compared to the big brother, the D5, the D5 is faster, it's cleaner, and if you're gonna be out in wet weather, the D5 is definitely the better choice. But the D500, cheaper, sharper, remarkably, lighter, wider focusing points that go all the way to the edge. It has better dynamic range, better 4K video because it doesn't limit, it's not limited to three minutes. It's got that awesome Wi Fi snap bridge and it's got a tilting screen, which we love. Let me just say a couple more words about snap bridge. This is, has the potential to be revolutionary for those of us who use social media. And an awful lot of photographers use social media. I know a lot of you don't care about Instagram and Twitter, but a big part of our job is communicating and sharing pictures. And the faster you can do that, the more important it is. So something like SnapBridge means I'll be taking a picture with the D500 instead of with my camera phone. It means no more back of camera pictures. Thank you, Nikon, for putting in SnapBridge. It's wonderful. Help support us. We get a few pennies out of every dollar when you buy through one of these links, sdp.io slash d500, or if you're shopping from somewhere else, you can go to sdp.io slash support us and see if we have an affiliate link you might be able to use. Of course, subscribe. It's free. You get three new videos every week. Tell your friends about our channel, please. That really helps us grow. And we have lots of books that can help you out because the most important thing about photography isn't your gear. It's your composition. It's your timing. It's your storytelling. It's your mood. It's how you express yourself. All this is taught in my book, Stunning Digital Photography, the number one photography book in the world. If you're into post-processing, we have books on Lightroom and Photoshop available. Pick them up at Amazon or go to sdp.io slash store. And if you just want to know everything about gear, there's a brand new version of my photography buying guide updated with everything, including these cameras. All these eBooks start at $9.99. The paperback books are 20 or 25 bucks. Support us. Thank you very much. Bye. Here are the YouTube comments before they happen. First, 
Oh, he's on Nikon's payroll now. What a shill. Oh, that's not what Chris and Jordan had to say about the D500. Oh, they said something different. You must be wrong. Oh, of course the 70 Mark II didn't win. It's two years old. Unfair. Where's the D750? Where's the Sony? Where's the Pentax? Oh, my favorite, the condescending comment. Oh, Tony, you did it again. When are you going to stop spreading this kind of misinformation?